I'm Marla Mendelson. I'm the director of the Women's Cardiovascular Health Program here at Northwestern. And what I'd like to do is to talk to you about um, our, a little bit about our program, the plans we have, and some of the new things that are, have become available um, within gender-based medicine as far as cardiology. And I'm really um, pleased to tell you that a lot of these things have come up in the last 10 days. So the information that I'm showing you is very new, and, um, and I think it's very interesting is when we take care of women with cardiovascular disease. So as you know, um, there's the Red Dress campaign, unless you were living in a cave for the last 10 years, people have been trying to address this issue, get the attention to women in cardiovascular disease by wearing the red dress, have people ask us why we're wearing the red dresses, and really focus on it. And the, the main thing is that women don't recognize that they get cardiovascular disease. And so much of our treatment of women with cardiovascular disease is just extrapolating from the guys. And we hope that there's enough information that we're doing everything right. When we look at our studies, and this is sort of a mea culpa, most of our studies in cardiovascular medicine maybe include 20% of women. And we certainly are just starting to crack the surface to look at these biologic and physiologic differences between men and women and how that's going to impact on our treatment strategies. So this is a very exciting time, and actually it's kind of a very exciting week. Um, the MESA study is a, an, a national study with several centers across the country, uh, and Northwestern is actually a, uh, participates in the MESA trial. So it's a very large trial, it's sort of a national type of Framingham trial, um, where they've been following people for many, many years. And I'm just going to summarize this briefly in the interest of time, is that we, um, what they found was that there were intrinsic differences in muscle mass. When you look at muscle mass on an MR study, there are intrinsic differences between men and women. So this plays a very important role, and you can just imagine how is this may impact on our diagnosis, our treatment, of um, hypertension, because all of us have seen women in our practice who have this diastolic hypertension, this thickening, um, which is obviously abnormal and not something you'd expect to see normally in women. In this, in this study, what they've talked about here is that the men have a, um, a higher muscle mass than the women. And it's not that surprising, but it's certainly we need to take it into account. And this actually, this graph looks at people as they age and, um, and that actually increases. So this is important to take these into account. And this is just early observational data, but we're starting to see a lot of these gender differences occur. Now this is the most sobering one, and this is the mortality rate after a cardiac event. And the top line is the women, and the bottom line is the, are the men, and we used to present this at about at this point in time, and things were looking really bad. Women were dying more often from cardiovascular events than men. We've really come a long way with men, and we were just lagging behind in women. And only in the last few years, we've seen this improvement in mortality in women. So that we think maybe this red dress campaign is actually working, that women are not sitting home when they're having their infarct, and instead they're coming to the hospital and they're taking advantage of the latest we have is in the setting of an acute MI. So we, things are improving. The other thing we have to consider, this was even Time Magazine has been interested in this issue, the how pregnancy, and, and Dr. Gerard mentioned pregnancy, and we could talk about pregnancy for days, but um, how pregnancy uh, plays a role in a woman's future cardiovascular risk. So at our center here at Northwestern, we really want to focus on women of all ages, women throughout the lifespan, because there are things that can happen during pregnancy, before pregnancy, that can portend cardiovascular disease in the future. And it's these women that we want to capture and, and, and keep an eye on. And um, this particular study looked at, um, let me go back, this particular study looked at um, cardiovascular events in women who had hypertension during pregnancy, which is quite common. And this is something that actually we've known for a long time. We like to think of it as sort of gestational hypertension, because gestational diabetes, we all recognize that portends diabetes later in life, but gestational hypertension does too. And not only for hypertension, but um, it will show um, a problem later on, and we'll get to that in a minute. So here's another recent study that just came out in the um, Journal of American Cardiology, Car um, College of Cardiology, looking at differences um, in young patients and predicting their outcomes. So again, we, we have not really seen this information before. I don't want to go into it in, in, in detail, but it's really important to look at 
some of the difference in perception of cardiovascular disease, and then again, this impacts on a patient's treatment, whether they buy into the treatment that we recommend. And it's not just in this country, because this is also data um, from Spain as well, looking at the US and Spain and men versus women as far as, for example, looking here at the self perceived risk of cardiovascular disease, and certainly men thought they were at higher risk of cardiovascular disease, both in the US and in Spain. So we need to, again, look at these perceptions and, and see how they go with reality. This is a very difficult slide to read, but it looks at the different risk factors. And certainly one of the overriding themes of this slide is that women and men both have risk factors for cardiovascular disease, so we should be able to tell in both groups who is at risk, even at, at a young age. So when we look at some of the studies, and this is part of the problem, is that this is a risk factor study, and this is MESA, which I talked about earlier. Um, we look at how are women represented in these studies. And when we do studies of risk factors, women are fairly well represented. You know, they get up to that 50 degree, 50% uh, mark. But when we start looking at intervention studies and lipid lowering studies, in the last column here looks at the percent of women in the studies, these are classic studies. These are the studies that drive our practice. Women are terribly underrepresented, except for the all hat, some of the more recent trials, the PROSPER and the all hat trial. And the all hat trial was really a study of hypertension. So this is something what we're working against right now. This is more of the um, more of the same. And then lastly, I wanted to show you the intervention trials, um, how women are represented. And they're poorly represented in the cardiac intervention trials. And part of this goes back to women are older, so they may get cut out of a trial just on age alone, or they may not come into the trial, they may not qualify for the trial. There's a lot of different factors there, but we're just not looking at it. And certainly, not only there's a new um, movement afoot from the um, National Institutes of Health and several of their subsections uh, that you have to do research, you have to do gender-based research in, uh, in both genders and not just in men because it's easier and not just in male animals. Um, and that goes back to the formulation of drugs and some of the problems we've had that when the, the research has only been done in the male animal model. This is not appropriate and it's in, in most cases. So I think everyone's starting to get that, uh, that message. And this is the last sort of gender-based recent study that came out looking at mortality rates after percutaneous coronary intervention. And here you can summarize, they look at the men and the women in the study, and there were more men in the study, but um, the, the women were, it was fairly comparable as far as their outcome. It used to be in the olden days women did not do well after angioplasty, but that was when our, our tools were a lot larger and ne less appropriate for the smaller vessels of women. Again, this is again looking at um, in-hospital outcomes in men and women, and that women do have a um, slightly increased risk. The next topic that we wanted to talk about is stroke in women, just briefly, and, and um, sort of very you know gingerly with a neurologist in the room. Um, stroke in women, there are some very important gender factors, gender-based factors that we have to consider. And this is again, we have to consider stroke in the entire rubric of cardiovascular disease. So a lot of these risk factors that are listed here are more common in women, and some of them are actually specific to women when we start looking at things like oral contraception and pregnancy and the migraine with oral, with Dr. Gerard uh, talked about already, and hormone replacement therapy. So those are individual things. And I would also add that we'll talk about later is it's um, Boniva, the medication for bone, has actually been associated with atrial fibrillation increasing a woman's risk of stroke. So I think these are important things to understand. Also, when a woman comes in with a stroke, she tends to be older and has more severe strokes. Um, so this is important in our practice. The atrial fibrillation is common. And when you go back to atrial fibrillation, we find that women are less often treated with aspirin when they present with atrial fibrillation, even though they qualify for aspirin therapy based on the CHADS or the chads VAS score. In fact, in the CHADS VAS score, which is an adaptation of the CHADS score, they added women as a risk factor, a female gender as a risk factor. So it's really important to, to look at these different aspects. More, women will also have more complications after stroke, and again, that may harken back to more concomitant illnesses, more hypertension, later presentation, more speech disorders, longer stay, um, and a less complete recovery. This is an article from Annals that looked at gender-specific areas where risk factors are certainly stronger in the female population, which we have alluded to. 
as, as far as stroke. So there is gender and based research being done. We mentioned briefly uh, atrial fibrillation in women. There's a higher prevalence of it. They have a, a higher thrombotic risk. Um, and as I mentioned, they're less likely to receive anticoagulation. Um, the, uh, and we mentioned the chad Bass score. And they're less likely to be referred for catheter ablation, which the rationale is unclear. Women at the time they present with their atrial fibrillation, they have probably more concomitant illnesses. The Women's Health Study, which is certainly a, um, a stepsister to the physicians, uh, the male physician's health study looking at the benefits of aspirin, actually showed that, um, that aspirin therapy was useful in the prevention of stroke in women, um, and it was prevention in stroke and MI in women over 65, which is very different than the physician's aspirin study, which really looked at a younger age group of the initiation of aspirin. They also used a kind of unusual dose in this study of 100 milligrams rather than the typical 81 milligrams that we often use. There are some differences, and these are more observational studies, so things have really not been completely explained. This, again, looks at some of these differences in the risks for um, men and women as far as aspirin therapy. So what are we doing here at Northwestern? Well, we have our program for cardiovascular disease in women, and we focus on all ages of a woman's life. We will, we want to, um, we start with pregnancy and before pregnancy when we're doing preconception evaluations and identifying a woman's risk factors. For example, the woman who presents with polycystic ovary syndrome, from our point of view, that's a metabolic problem that could impact on her future cardiovascular health. So we're really trying to establish care. We um, are working as far as education and we have research projects that are ongoing. So we want to raise awareness, and uh, we do this in a form of an annual conference uh, for the community and for health professionals. We do them basically on the same day, and we have pretty much the same speakers talking about similar topics. Um, we, uh, we have found this. This will be our ninth year this coming May. It will be our ninth symposium, and uh, we try to vary the topics and really stay very current as far as cardiovascular disease in women um, particularly. Uh, we also want to coordinate gender-based research here at Northwestern, and these are some of the projects that we've done recently. We've looked at the outcome in valve surgery um, in women specifically, and again, we have a lot of those same themes that women may not do as well because they're older, have more severe illnesses. We are looking at cardiac status after breast cancer treatment. Many of the agents that are used for breast cancer therapy can be cardiotoxic. And what does this mean? And we're looking at echocardiographic measurements of strain pattern to look at subtle differences in the, uh, in the heart after treatment. And what about the, and we're doing another study looked at the gender difference in the electrocardiograph, elect, electrocardiograms of elite athletes. Um, there's another, one of my um, colleagues is doing a study on gender differences in that heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which is interesting because that is more common in women. And we're working on uh, preconception evaluation of women with heart disease in who, trying to ask, asking the question, when is pregnancy safe and can we make a woman a better candidate for a pregnancy? So basically, we, we try to practice gender-based care as this information becomes available and, and educate our colleagues and create local guidelines. So this is just a blatant advertisement for our conference in, on May 9th, our professional conference. And these are the topics we're hoping to, we're going to be discussing. It'll be hormones in the heart, um, TAVR, percutaneous valve replacement results in women, heart failure in women, genetic basis of cardiovascular disease, and the novel anticoagulants for, anti, for atrial fibrillation because we've identified that as a problem. Why are we doing this? Because this is what we all want to be. Okay, this is what we want everybody, we want our patients to be here, and um, this is why we do what we do.